Not so long ago, I thought of topology as that strange part of math where a donut is the same thing as a coffee mug. It felt like some crazy abstract world. Interesting, but way too far from anything practical. Then, I came across a paper that completely changed that view. It showed how mathematicians use tools from topology to study whether polling sites are fairly distributed across cities. How could something so abstract as topology be connected to something as concrete as politics? Isn't that both cool and a little surprising? As I dug deeper, I realized that this wasn't an isolated case. Ideas from algebraic topology have been applied to datasets in all kinds of fields. Voting patterns in the Brexit referendum, the Trump versus Clinton election in 2016, biological transport systems, and even human migration networks. Topological data analysis, or TDA for short, is a growing toolkit for finding the shape of data. In this video, I'll give an intuitive introduction to TDA, what it is, why it works, and why it matters. Throughout the video, I'll use the polling site paper as a running example and at the end we'll see what the analysis actually revealed about voting access. You may have noticed I've been throwing around with three terms, topology, algebraic topology and topological data analysis. Are these just three fancy names for the same thing? Not quite. Topology is that branch of mathematics that studies the properties of shapes that don't change under continuous deformation, things like stretching, bending or twisting. That's why a donut and a coffee mug are considered the same in topology, one whole just in different forms. Algebraic topology takes this further. It uses the language of algebra, groups, homology, and so on to study these topological spaces in a way that can be calculated and computed. And finally, topological data analysis brings these ideas into the world of data. It applies tools from algebraic topology to datasets, letting us study their shape and extract meaningful patterns like clusters or holes. So how does that actually work in practice? Let's build it up step by step. Back in 2021, President Biden announced a goal, make sure 90% of Americans live within 5 miles of a COVID vaccination site. Similarly, in India, the law requires every voter to have a polling site within 2 kilometers. At first, that sounds reasonable, but this kind of rule has two problems. First, it forces you to pick an arbitrary cut of distance, like 5 miles or 2 kilometers or something else. Second, pure geography doesn't tell the whole story. Factors like population density, traffic and access to public transportation matter just as much, if not more. This is exactly where TDA can help. But before we dive into the method, we need a way to represent our data. That's where simplicial complexes come in. Think of polling sites as a bunch of points, what mathematicians call a point cloud. Each point is a zero simplex. If two points are connected, we get an edge, a one simplex. The end points of the edge are its faces, three edges form a triangle. That's a two simplex, and its edges and points are all faces of the triangle. Four triangles form a tetrahedron. That's a three simplex, whose faces are its triangles, edges and points. And so on. By combining these building blocks, we create a simplicial complex. But not just any collection of simplices will do. There are two rules. Every face of a simplex must also be in the complex. If two simplices intersect, their intersection has to be a face of both. So, for instance, this is not a simplicial complex because their intersection is not a face of both. Now that we know what simplicial complexes are, the next question is how do we actually build them from data? Suppose we have a set of points. One approach is to grow a ball of radius r around each point. If two balls overlap, we connect the two points with an edge. If three balls all overlap, we fill in a triangle. If four overlap, we add a tetrahedron and so on. The collection of all these simplices at scale r is called the check complex. Check complexes are beautiful in theory by something called the Nerf theorem. It states that the check complex has the same shape, technically the same homology, as the union of all those balls. But they are very expensive to compute since you need to check overlaps of many balls at once. That's where the Vietorius Rips complex comes in. It's an approximation that's much easier to compute. Instead of checking whether all the balls overlap, we just check pairwise distances. If every pair of points in a set is within 2 times r, then we connect them into a simplex. There's even a neat relationship between the two, which shows that the Vietorius Rips complex is always sandwiched between two check complexes. What's powerful here is that we only need to be in a metric space, some space where we can measure distances. That means we don't have to use ordinary geographical distance. In the polling site study, for example, the distance between two sites was defined as the expected time it takes to travel between them, plus the waiting time once you arrive. This is much more realistic than just measuring kilometers on a map. 
So check and Vietorio's rips complexes give us a way to turn raw data into a combinatorial object, a simplicial complex. And by tweaking the metric, we can tailor this construction to the real world problem we care about. When I've shown you what a check and Vietorio's rips complexes are, I showed you an animation where the radius r grows gradually. This allows us to see how the complex evolves. As r increases, edges appear, then triangles, then higher dimensional simplices. Holes may open up and eventually they may fill in. This evolving sequence of complexes is called a filtration. Formally, it's just a nested chain. Now, here's where things get interesting. As the filtration runs, certain topological features appear and later disappear. A birth simplex is the simplex that creates a new feature like a connected component or a hole. A death simplex is the one that fills it in and makes it vanish. Let's look at the filtration shown on the screen. A 1D homology class, or simpler said, a hole, is born at step 2. Its birth simplex is the edge with vertices 0 and 3. This homology class that is born at step 2 subsequently dies at step 4, as there is no hole anymore. Its death simplex is the triangle with vertices 0, 2 and 3. This language of births and deaths gives us a way to keep track of the life story of topological features. And that's exactly what persistent homology is about, recording which features appear, how long they persist and which ones are just fleeting noise. To visualize how long a feature persists, we can use barcodes and persistence diagrams. In a barcode, each feature is a horizontal bar. It starts at its birth scale and ends at its death scale. Long bars usually represent meaningful structure, while very short ones are often noise. In a persistence diagram, the same information is shown as points. Each point's x-coordinate is the birth scale and the y-coordinate is the death scale. We have two very important types of features for our examples. The zero-dimensional homology classes. These correspond to connected components. Each point starts as its own component at the birth and as the balls grow, components merge. The death of a 0D class is the moment its component connects to another one. So 0D features track how clusters merge together. One-dimensional homology classes are also very important. These correspond to loops or cycles. Imagine four points forming a square. At first, edges connect them into a cycle, so a 1D hole is born. When the diagonal eventually appears and fills in the square, the hole dies. In applications, 1D features often reveal holes in coverage. This perspective was applied in the study of polling sites by treating polling locations as points and defining distance not only as physical distance but as time to vote, including travel time and waiting time. When building their simplicial complex, the authors used what they call a weighted Vitoris rips complex, which is a more sophisticated VR complex, but I won't go more into detail. So using a clever way to construct the complex and the distance, the authors could reveal where access was uneven. In their case, larger homology class death values suggest that a city may have worse coverage and a wider distribution of death values suggests that there may be more variation in a polling site accessibility within a city. Some areas like Chicago had well distributed sites while others like Los Angeles or New York City showed inequities due to traffic or long queues. Persistent homology provided a way to detect holes in access, regions where voters were effectively isolated. So the main idea is flexible. By choosing a suitable type of simplicial complex and a meaningful notion of distance, persistent homology can highlight structural patterns in the data. Thanks for watching until the end. I hope you enjoyed the video and that you are as fascinated as I was when I first discovered that something as abstract as topology can actually be applied to real world problems like voting and politics.